Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, my name is Jim Schof. I'm a senior associate here in the Asia program and in charge of our Japan studies. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you here on such a beautiful day. Uh, and it's a distinct pleasure to welcome, welcome Lieutenant General John Whistler uh, here to Carnegie. We were fortunate to catch him uh, during a visit to, to Washington, and, and we appreciate the opportunity to hear from him directly about what he and his team have been doing in and around Japan, uh, how the rebalance to Asia looks from his vantage point, and how he is partnering with Japan and with other countries in the region uh, to pursue the, the objectives of the rebalance policy. Now, General Whistler comes to us from Okinawa, where he is commander of the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Force and the commander of Marine Forces Japan. Earlier in his career, he served in Okinawa as an executive officer in the 1st Marine Air Wing, and he went on to serve in a wide range of, of field and, and staff positions, assignments after that. Uh, among his field assignments, he served twice in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom, and on the staff side, his resume includes uh, work for the White House as a Marine Corps aide to the president in the early 1990s. He headed up the war room for uh, General James Jones when General Jones was commandant of the Marine Corps, and uh, he was a senior military assistant to Deputy Secretary of Defense, uh, Gordon England at the time. Uh, more recently, and part of what we'll hear about today, he was assigned the responsibility to command Joint Task Force 505, which was the U.S. military support team that assisted the massive relief effort following the super typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines in November last year. And General Whistler will touch on this, and we'll have a chance to, to see a, a, a short video of, of, about that, that response. Um, that brings me to, to one point I'd like to make before I... Uh, turn the floor over to uh, General Whistler, uh, which is that his two experiences, commander of U.S. Marines in Japan and Joint Task Force 505 uh, commander, to me help highlight the evolution of the U.S. military presence in Japan and in Asia since the end of World War II and Japan's own transformation as well. The, the legacy of, of the Marines' presence in Okinawa began as a platform for the planned invasion of Honshu, Japan in 1945. It then became an integral part of the forward U.S. military presence in the region with the dual purpose of uh, helping to protect Japan's security because of strict limits on Japan's armed forces and to support regional peace and stability uh, in the region. Early on, on this latter purpose, uh, was characterized uh, by large-scale conflicts in Korea and Vietnam, but this has given way to a less ideological and broader multilateral kind of security cooperation, even as North Korea remains a, an outlier in this evolving system. Now, we have seen since the late 1970s an increase in Japan's ability to do more for its own defense, and since the late 1990s, a willingness and ability in Japan to do more in support of regional peace and stability. Not so much to replace the role of the United States, uh, on these fronts, but to be a more capable and valuable uh, contributor, opening up new opportunities bilaterally and with others to help meet the new challenges that we all face. Uh, we've seen this in missile defense cooperation vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, and it was on clear display in the multilateral effort uh, together with the Philippines last fall, uh, with the largest and fastest Japanese response that we've seen to date. Uh, and there, I believe there's an opportunity to do more in the future. So the important point I wanted to make is that this is a very dynamic evolution. And, when, and with the United States and Japan as, as key players, and when you think of dynamic, you think of the Marines. And when you think of the Marines in Asia, uh, you think now of Lieutenant General John Whistler and the third MEF. And with that, uh, I'd like to introduce not. the general to, uh, to make his remarks, and then we'll have a chance to ask questions later on. Thank Thanks. you. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Lieutenant General John Whistler. I wear uh, a number of hats in Okinawa, Japan. As was mentioned, I'm the commanding general of three Marine Expeditionary Force. I'm also, uh, when required, when appointed by the Pacific Command Commander, Admiral Locklear, I am the commander of JTF 505, Joint Task Force 505. Uh, 
a joint task force that is focused on humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. I'm also the commander of Marine Forces Japan. Today, the total number of personnel serving in Marine Forces Japan is three. Uh, myself, my deputy commander, Major General Chuck Hudson, and a uh, government service employee who uh, controls all of the uh, military uh, labor that we have uh, with our Japanese partners in Okinawa. Uh, obviously, in time of conflict, that could change and that staff becomes different. But I also wear a different hat. If you were to ask any Okinawan who I was, if you showed, me a, showed them a photograph, they would tell you that I'm the Okinawa Area Coordinator. Uh, because I am the senior representative on Okinawa from all of the military services. And so uh, when, I, when my name shows up in the press in Okinawa, it rarely shows up as the commanding general of three Marine Expeditionary Force or the commander of Marine Forces Japan, but rather the Okinawa Area Coordinator. Uh, there are many people in this audience uh, who know a lot more about Asia than I do, so I am not going to profess to be an expert uh, I don't know how many of you folks uh, remember who the quarterback for the Green Bay Packers was after Bart Starr. Probably not many of you. A guy named Zeke Bartkowski. Compared to some of the experts in the audience, General Gregson and others, I am the Zeke Bartkowski here today. Um, but I will give you a, a laydown of what is going on in uh, in Japan and in Asia with regard to Marines as we uh, execute our responsibilities uh, for Marine Forces Pacific and for, uh, for Admiral Locklear. Uh, as I said, one of those hats I wear is the JTF-505 Commander. Three Marine Expeditionary Force, today about uh, 19,470 Marines west of the international date line. Um, execute responsibilities across the range of military operations by being forward present and forward stationed in Asia to be able to respond to crises or contingencies. And by being forward present and by being forward stationed, we can do so in a period of hours and not days. And that ability to respond in hours and not days is what makes a difference in saving lives. In Asia, in any given year, about 70,000 people lose their lives to natural disasters. Uh, we feel that we made a big difference last fall when we were able to respond as Joint Task Force 505 uh, to the destruction that uh, occurred with uh, Typhoon Yolanda or Typhoon Haiyan, depending on uh, if you're from the Philippines, it was referred to as Yolanda. Um, and we were able to save lives because we were able to respond in hours and not days. The 3rd Marine Expeditionary Brigade, led by Brigadier General Paul Kennedy, uh, within six hours of notification from the Pacific Command commander that we were going to respond on behalf of the United States, uh, left Okinawa and then uh, two and a half hours later was on the ground in Manila to begin operations. The next day, we began distributing essential supplies uh, with C-130s, and the following day began fusing with our MV-22 Osprey, a tremendous aircraft that we could not have been able to succeed the way we did if we did not have that partnership between our C-130s and our V-22s. So that's what 3MEF does. We're forward present. We're forward stationed, forward based to be able to respond to crises as they occur whether it's humanitarian assistance and disaster relief or whether something should happen on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, at the end of this uh, presentation, I'll show you a short video of a recent uh, combined Marine Expeditionary Brigade operation that we conducted with our Korean counterparts and also our, uh, our Australian counterparts on the peninsula of Korea. With that as lead-in, I'll, I'll show you. This is just a, a quick uh, summary of kind of what took place uh, last November for uh, three Marine Expeditionary Force as the headquarters of JTF 505, but a, but a full uh, complement of uh, U.S. military capability, uh, Air Force, Army, Marine, and Navy that responded uh, to that tragedy. So with that...
On November 8, 2013, Typhoon Haiyan made landfall in the Republic of the Philippines with sustained winds of 185 miles per hour. It became one of the strongest storms in recorded history. This looked like an F5 tornado, 60 miles wide, that flattened everything in its path. The devastation was unlike any typhoon or hurricane that I've ever seen. Before the debris could settle, Marines from 3rd Marine Expeditionary Brigade deployed from Okinawa, Japan, and began to fly aid and supplies to those suffering in the hardest hit areas. From the first day we got there, we emphasized that we were there to provide a unique capability, to provide things that could not in fact be provided by the Armed Forces of the Philippines and by the government and the people of the Philippines themselves. Bringing food and water to people who are thirsty and hungry. The relief on their faces was immediate. People coming up to us saying, as soon as we see an American helicopter, we know we're saved. They started on Monday with C-130s, and on Tuesday they started with the V-22s. Our MV-22s proved absolutely vital to provide a capability, a life-saving capability, to the people of the Philippines. After two weeks of round-the-clock operations, the unique capabilities of the Marines were no longer required. Joint Task Force 505 began a coordinated retrograde, allowing the Armed Forces of the Philippines, non-governmental organizations, and other friendly nations to continue the ongoing relief effort. We worked until the Filipino government uh, was able to restore infrastructure and take over for themselves. Tremendous capability represented by the Navy Marine Corps team, but one that would not have been capable had we not been forward present. Operation Damayan highlighted the importance of having Marines forward deployed as the expeditionary force in the Pacific. The Marines were able to provide more than 2,400 tons of relief cargo and evacuated 21,000 victims from some of the most devastated areas of the country. The United States Marine Corps is committed to supporting humanitarian assistance and disaster relief throughout the Asia-Pacific region and around the world. So that's kind of our most recent piece where we've been able to support uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. This slide here, which is I'm sure difficult for you to see in the in the back, but this is kind of the this is the snapshot that I get every day uh, of of where my MEF is and what they're doing. As I said, uh, over 19,000 west of the international date line, uh, and uh, a little over 6,000 who are currently spread across the Asia Pacific region. Uh, in different countries, uh, doing theater security cooperation, doing mil military to military operations. Uh, we also are operating against uh, uh, terrorists in uh, the southern parts of the Philippines right now, uh, and uh, and continuing to build uh, capabilities across all of Asia. Uh, you want to show up the next slide. By the end of this, uh, by the end of this is just a picture. This is kind of a snapshot of what the year 2014 is going to look like when we're finished at the end of this fiscal year, by the 30th of September. By the end of 30 September, we'll have been in 21 of the 36 countries uh, in the Asia Pacific. Just recently, uh, work we've done uh, to reestablish demining efforts, as an example, in Cambodia. Uh, we'll exercise uh, in Vietnam. Uh, we will have uh, a near-continuous presence in Korea, Japan, Australia, the Philippines, and Thailand. We have 81 exercises that are planned across the entire region. And in addition to those 81 exercises, we'll execute 57 unit-level training exercises. 
training on behalf of my Marines as we continue to maintain our proficiency to execute our responsibilities across that range of military operations. Just this week, as we're standing here, the next iteration of our Marines in uh, Australia have arrived. About 1,200 Marines, a Marine Air Ground Task Force, four CH-53 helicopters, uh, an infantry battalion reinforced with engineers uh, and light armored vehicles, as well as uh, organic logistics capabilities. We'll operate for the next six months uh, in partnership with our Australian partners, but also execute uh, some amphibious, uh, beginning of amphibious training with our partners in New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand, Australia, and Japan, three of our national security, three of the five national security partners that we have uh, are building amphibious capability. The Japanese intend to have a brigade amphibious capability within the next five years. And uh, I've been given the responsibility by Admiral Locklear and by uh, Lieutenant General Robling, the commander of Marine Forces Pacific, to be that face-to-face uh, -face partner with our Japanese counterparts. We initiated work with our Japanese counterparts uh, in January uh, with an amphibious seminar brought uh, our experts, if you will, on amphibious warfare out to Okinawa and had every element of the Japan Self-Defense Force, air, maritime, and ground, in the same room at the general officer, flag officer, and senior planner level and ran through those things that are required to develop amphibious capability such that they could continue to develop this amphibious capability. Uh, we have partnered with them. They've had elements of the ground self-defense force that have actually deployed with the 31st Marine Expeditionary Unit. Uh, most recently, we conducted small boat raid training with them where they conducted a 55-kilometer long-distance boat raids from sea to shore uh, in some pretty miserable conditions, and they did it exceptionally well. So we're building that partnership. As I said, the, uh, the New Zealanders are building an amphibious capability, as are the Australians. And as part of that, they sent a company of infantry to participate with us as we develop, uh, as we executed uh, our partnership with our Korean Marine partners. Uh, Malaysia is uh, in the process of building a, a small Marine Corps, uh, and we will be partnered with them as they build their Marine Corps. Not sure exactly what that will look like at this time, uh, but we're there uh, to help them build that capability. In addition to those three of our uh, Security Alliance partners who are building amphibious capability, two of them, Korea and Thailand, uh, already have amphibious capabilities. And we exercise those capabilities. Most recently for us, um, we exercised in uh, an, uh, an exercise called Cobra Gold, uh, the largest multi uh, lateral military operation in Asia uh, just concluded uh, in, uh, in uh, late February, early March. And we executed amphibious operations with our Thai partners, but also with our, uh, with our Korean partners who were there uh, for that training. We uh, will begin training in the Philippines, uh, Exercise Balakatan. Uh, that exercise... Uh, annually is a large humanitarian assistance disaster relief exercise. We completed that exercise last year in this spring time frame and then unfortunately had to execute uh, those capabilities. What came out of, the, out of the, uh, the training last year and what came to absolute perfection uh, in execution uh, in Operation Demayan was the multinational coordination center concept to bring in all of these uh, international capabilities. In total, 18 other countries uh, came to the assistance of the Philippines. And to be able to coordinate uh, all of those military activities, some from ships, some from uh, aircraft, C-130s, some simply from medical teams, uh, and to be able to place those capabilities in the hardest hit areas, uh, where we needed them, when they needed them, was all facilitated, once again, by being forward present, by our training and our ability to operate with the armed forces of the Philippines, to create those personal relationships so that when I went to the Philippines as the JTF commander uh, and met with the head of the uh, armed forces of the Philippines, uh, it was not the first time that uh, General Bautista and I 
had seen each other, had sat down, had had discussions. And more importantly, when General Kennedy arrived, he had been there less than one month before uh, in an amphibious training exercise that we had completed with our Philippine partners. I mentioned that we have our Marines down in Australia, and they will be there for the next six months. Uh, They'll be there for six months because the weather is so bad that uh, during the wet season, we will have uh, no Marine presence down in Australia. Those Marines will come back. Uh, The next uh, unit deployment program uh, Marines will come back to Okinawa, and they will train uh, in other countries around the area. Uh, It's a maritime theater. And we have a great maritime capability. I already mentioned the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Brigade. They stand for me an alert contingency, MAGTAF, or Marine Air Ground Task Force, responsibility. Uh, They are required to be able to be airborne within six hours to respond to whatever the tragedy is and wherever it occurs. And we exercise them about monthly. Um, I either go to bed or wake up and make a phone call to the command center and then within six hours, uh, they're off going somewhere that we've pre-planned with our aviation assets. Once when they arrive, they have to set up all their communications, and then we begin passing both voice, uh, data, and other things so that I know that they can go and command and control any sort of a disaster response. We always have on deck the 31st Marine Expeditionary Unit, three amphibious ships from the four deployed naval force, Admiral Weatherall that you saw in that video, is the commander of the Task Force 76, the amphibious task force that supports us, our Navy partner, and the Navy Marine Corps team that is forward deployed there in the, in the Pacific. And we use three of the four ships that are in that forward deployed naval force to conduct two patrols annually, a spring patrol, which is just coming to a close, and then uh, there'll be a fall patrol. And that fall patrol uh, will uh, we'll participate in operations in Malaysia, as I mentioned, in support of that uh, that budding capability uh, that the Malaysians are trying to bring, and then it would be uh, I would be remiss if I did not mention our maritime prepositioning squadron, which is home based in Guam, uh, but we use the ships from that maritime prepositioning squadron to execute operations. Most recently, we used the USNS Sacagawea, uh, T A K E, an amphibious cargo ship, uh, or not amphibious, but a, a USNS cargo ship in support of this, uh, this amphibious operation that we did in the Philippines, or excuse me, in Korea. But we can also use it uh, in many other places, uh, most notably uh, for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. We used one of the ships from the Maritime Preposition Force actually to take equipment down to Australia in support of the Marines who recently deployed down there. So it's a, it's a maritime theater It's a maritime theater that requires us to be out and about to conduct uh, those different operations that you see there. And over the course of time, 35,000 sets of marine and sailor boots will set foot on those 21 countries. As I told you that I only have 19,000, a little more than, marines west of the international date line. So that means every marine in the MEF will get out to two sometimes three different locations in the area of operations uh, during, during their time uh, in this next fiscal year. I mentioned that our responsibilities are across the range of military operations. We just completed, as I mentioned, the largest amphibious exercise in the Pacific uh, in the last 20 years. Our Republic of Korea Marine counterpart, my counterpart was the Commandant of the ROC Marine Corps, uh, Lieutenant General Lee. Lieutenant General Lee and our staff actually began uh, this exercise in, the early, uh, in early January with training and follow that up with the beginnings of a maritime pre-positioning uh, exercise, follow that up with a combined Marine Component Command command post exercise. We're integrated into our staff. We're U.S. and ROC Marine counterparts where we exercised over a 14-day period command post exercise, and then culminated it with a Marine Expeditionary Brigade, combined Marine Expeditionary Brigade landing. Uh, Over 20 ships from both the U.S. and the Republic of Korea, uh, as well as, um, as I mentioned, uh, soldiers from the Australian Defense Force who are part of their 
2nd Division, which will be their amphibious division as they develop an amphibious capability and field their first amphibious ships uh, sometime, we think, in 2015. With that, uh, I'll show this quick video, and then I will stand by to take your questions for the rest of the day. Or at least the rest of the hour. Or at least the rest of the hour. On March 31, 2014, U.S. Marines and sailors worked in conjunction with Marines and soldiers from the Republic of Korea and the Australian Army to take part in Exercise Sang Yong 14. Sang Yong 14 is the culmination of a multitude of training events and exercises between the U.S. and ROC forces, which take place across the Asia Pacific region throughout the year. This year's evolution was the largest in its storied history and it was comprised of three expeditionary units, two U.S. and one ROC. The exercise was led by the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Brigade, based in Okinawa, Japan, and showcased both interoperability and sea-based operations in the Korean Peninsula. When I watched 13 ships come together, both the U.S. Navy and the ROC Navy, and, and as we met yesterday for the first time, we folded into a tight formation seamlessly bringing these two forces together. And that's just an example of how mature our relationship is, how well we work together with our Navy partners. As the exercise commenced, the Marines began training with their multinational counterparts. The focus of this year's exercise was sea-based power projection and the ability to rapidly deploy forces anywhere in the region to accomplish full-spectrum operations. As exercise Sang Yong gained momentum, the multinational force partnered to engage in a full-scale amphibious beach assault. This exercise is kind of a validation of the fact that it did not take us a generation of Marines to get back to doing amphibious operations on a larger scale. That we were able to do this through a lot of hard staff work and a lot of cooperation and a lot of just spirit. As ships moved into position, the exercise transitioned from maritime to assault operations. Marine and ROC forces loaded into amphibious vehicles and began the ship-to-shore movement. The integration has been seamless whenever we've had an opportunity to train, be it in field operations or just training exercises. Uh, we've tried to implement them in everything we do and vice versa. I would say that we've had an outstanding working relationship and look forward to working with them again. While forces were swiftly moving across the beach, Marine Corps aircraft moved in overhead. With speed and agility, Marine aviation moved seamlessly over the battle space, providing crucial aerial integration and fire support to the forces on the ground. As forces moved inland, they were able to integrate and focus on ground command and control while securing simulated objectives. It's been really good. Uh, a lot of good training values come out of it. Uh, working with Marines has been great. Every time I work with them, it's always good. Uh, always look after us really well. So uh, it's good exercise to come on. I'm really privileged. Both U.S. and ROC forces were able to gain crucial knowledge and experience while training together. Despite language and cultural differences, the service members were able to create relationships and build on their expertise. As the exercise drew to a close and the ships set sail, the Navy and Marine Corps team were able to once again validate power projection from the sea and their commitment to being the, quote, first to fight and win tonight.
by for your questions. Thank you very much, uh, General. I appreciate that. Um, if, if I may, I'd like to, to, uh, to, to ask a couple of quick questions uh, sure. off the beginning. Um, uh, that was a very interesting video. Now I understand what the North Koreans were so uh, animated about. <laughs> um, but uh, if, one quick question I wanted to ask you, because I've heard you talk about this before, uh, was the, the role that Japan played in the uh, uh, relief effort in the Philippines. And yeah. your estimation of what, uh, how that fit into the overall operation, what was particularly valuable there, and, sure. and, and what they brought to the table, uh, and what that uh, offers for the future. Yeah, the, uh, the Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force already has uh, ships which, while not uh, necessarily amphibious ships, can be used in an amphibious role. And in fact, just before the typhoon uh, hit the Philippines, I had the opportunity to be out on board uh, the Issei, one of their uh, uh, helicopter destroyers. Uh, looks a lot like uh, one of our old uh, LPH amphibious ships, a large flat deck from which you can fly lots of helicopters, has a, has a large hangar deck you can do helicopter maintenance on. Um, and so uh, I'd been out, we had been supporting them as they were working on some amphibious operations from that platform and then uh, returned from that uh, operation, and uh, we were then sent to the Philippines. As we were getting ready to, uh, to leave the Philippines, um, they, had be they were part for, a, there was about a four or five day overlap uh, with their amphibious task force, for lack of a better word, uh, centered around the Issei. Um, one of the concerns we had was how we would do air traffic control in and out of uh, the airfield at uh, Tacloban because that was a vital nerve center for bringing people and relief supplies. Um, and the ground lines of communication had been opened, but there was still a need for that airfield to operate. And so as we were looking how we would hand off uh, the responsibilities in the Philippines to partners, uh, our Japanese partners happened to show up with a ship, which could, in fact, because of its radars and its other capabilities on board the ship, control air traffic in and out uh, of that area. They also came with a medical capability and as well uh, embarked infantry that came ashore to assist in the further, uh, the further process of cleaning up after, after the disaster. Uh, we were through the phase of uh, getting relief supplies uh, water, uh, and uh, places uh, for people to stay. And we were now sort of beginning into that, uh, that uh, rebuilding phase. And the Japanese came in and were very helpful in kind of a seamless handoff into Cloban. We had a very similar seamless handoff uh, with the Australians uh, in another uh, part of that area. Uh, and uh, and we, uh, with the armed forces of the Philippines, they had taken the overall command and control. So it was very helpful for us. Uh, one of our partners, the Japanese, who we had in fact worked with just before this operation, to be able to hand off, if you will, those responsibilities. And they brought a technical capability as well as a, uh, a partnered capability for us to, to talk with them uh, to execute operations. Uh, I have uh, on my staff in 3MEF, I have uh, liaison officers from the Japan Ground Self-Defense Force. My liaison, my senior liaison officer, uh, I actually deployed to the Philippines with, the, uh, with Japan's uh, disaster relief response capability. And so he acted as the liaison between our two forces, between the Joint Task Force and the Japan Force, as we did that handoff. So once again, someone who I work with every day uh, was uh, now working with us in a different role, but as a liaison officer between our two nations, if you will, our two nations' militaries as we executed those response uh, uh, responsibilities. Thank you. Um, very quickly, I wanted to ask one other question, and this, it, it's connected to that. Uh, people who hear me talk know that I'm, I'm a big proponent of regional security cooperation as, as a, a, be it a confidence building measure or building capacity to deal with, with collective challenges and, and support collective interests. 
Uh, it's a big part of the U.S. rebalance to Asia strategy, working with allies um, and, and partners in the region and regional institutions. Uh, we've made some progress, but the, a lot of the critics will say that, you know, what we've, it's still so limited in terms of, of what we can do in the region, whether it's for political reasons or because of capacity uh, uh, constraints in, in the region. From your vantage point, what are, where do we kind of stand with, 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 with that policy or approach? What, what are some of the priorities that you see going forward um, if, if we're going to make that to be a more valuable part of, 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 of regional security going forward? How do we uh, make it a little bit more successful? Well, I think that we, we simply need to expand on some of the things that we're already doing. I mentioned the exercise Cobra Gold. Um, Republic of Korea Marines were involved in exercise Cobra Gold. Uh, we had Australian uh, Defense Force. Uh, the Singapore military was there, U.S. military, Thai. Uh, the, the, I, I don't remember all of the countries, but it was the largest multilateral operation. I think as we continue to do those sorts of multilateral operations, uh, we will continue to build the partnership uh, between countries. Um, it is, it's, it's very interesting, but most all of the militaries uh, in the region want to work with the other militaries. Uh, and, uh, and we can facilitate that um, because we can usually bring a capability, particularly with the Navy Marine Corps team, where we don't we don't provide much of an impact to infrastructure because we can come from the sea, if you will, and we can live on the sea, but we can come and partner with them, and then we can, just as uh, you know, uh, unobtrusively as we've arrived, we can leave those countries and continue to build those relationships. I think you'll see Cobra Gold will expand even more. The Japanese, uh, the Japan Self-Defense Force has, has uh, has asked that perhaps they be allowed to participate in the uh, in the amphibious portion of that exercise in this coming year. Uh, whether that takes place or not, I, I don't know. That will probably be. A, that, I'm sure there will be many country to country discussions that have to take place to make that happen. But similarly, the Chinese were represented last year. One of my engineer platoons uh, executed uh, a humanitarian uh, uh, construction project, for lack of a better word. Uh, in Thailand, uh, partnered side by side with the Chinese military. Um, uh, there's a large command post exercise that takes place as part of that exercise, and the participants in that exercise are ever expanding. So I think as we just continue to kind of chip away at these different exercises, uh, I know that uh, General Batista had mentioned, I have not seen confirmation of it, but he was attempting to hold after our exercise battle at Catan, which will commence here in, uh, in May, uh, he was uh, trying to hold a one- or two-day uh, multinational seminar to once again look at where we were successful in that multinational <coughs> coordination center, but also to see uh, where we weren't so successful and how we can perhaps make that more successful and how we can build on, on an expectation of what other nations could bring uh, to bear in the event of a crisis anywhere. While we were executing those responsibilities in the Philippines, uh, there was a volcanic eruption uh, in Indonesia. Uh, ended up not being so significant that we needed to do anything about it. But there was a time where I had another headquarters, my division headquarters, uh, was sitting on the ramp in Okinawa ready to respond uh, to be command and control for something that they would need to do in Indonesia. Uh, and so I think that as these nations, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, Natural disasters in Asia, uh, I believe the statistics are they're four times more likely to happen than they are to happen in the, in the African continent and 25 times more likely to happen than they are in the United States or North, you know, North America. Uh, and so something's going to happen. 70,000 people on average are killed in natural disasters annually. So these nations are starting to bring their militaries together to be able to respond. And the more times we can train together, to continue to operate together, uh, to do bilateral and multilateral uh, training, uh, it, it improves uh, greatly those capabilities. Thank you. Uh, let me offer the audience a, a chance to ask questions. Uh, when I call on you, just let us know who you are and, and where you're from. And uh, we'll begin here uh, in the green tie. Oh, we have a microphone coming as well. Oh, I was going to start here. 
but then we'll move to the back. Sorry. Sir, good afternoon. George Nicholson, a policy consultant with the U.S. Special Operations Command. A question about interface from the theater. You had alluded to support and counterterrorist operations in the southern Philippines. What's the lash up the SOC PAX uh, activities down there? And the other thing, I think about two months ago, uh, General Amos and also Admiral McRaven announced that starting, I think, this spring, there's going to be a five man planning cell out of SOCOM or out of SOP deploying with each of the ARGs going up. It's going to include having a JSOC rep to give you that, uh, that interface. And along the same lines, we've withdrawn all of our uh, rotary wing assets out of SOP, out of the Pacific, until we put CV-22s out there. With the capabilities that you've got right now with NV-22s, is there any kind of interface uh, with, with uh, Admiral Locklear's commanders and extremist force being able to provide airlift for that unit, which, again, is the first of the, the yeah. first... Our, our operations in the Philippines are directly in support of the Joint Special Operations Task Force Philippines. So they're tightly coordinated with the, with the operations that are going on in SOCOM and SOCPAC. Uh, in fact, those Marines are, that's their exclusive mission is to support the SOCPAC mission. So it's not a mission that I have other than to support SOCPAC. Um, to get to your, your question about the uh, the the Special Operations Force liaison elements, the softlies. Uh, they've deployed the first softly now with 11th Marine Expeditionary Unit, which is in the CENTCOM AOR. Uh, but similarly, 31st Marine Expeditionary Unit just this week concluded operations in support of uh, Charlie 1-1, which is uh, Army Special Operations Detachments headquartered in Okinawa, Japan. Uh, brought them out on board the amphibious ship, uh, did through a whole rehearsal and planning, and then exercised what would be uh, an embassy rescue, if you will, with special operations forces, using those MV-22 Ospreys as a rotary wing lift capability in support of them. In addition to that, my headquarters will gain a special operations forces liaison element from SOC Corps, from the Special Operations Command Korea uh, elements, and we will use them in planning and then in execution and training as we execute our responsibilities on the Korean Peninsula. So uh, we are tied very tightly to Special Operations Command. Marine Corps Special Operations Company is in the initial phases of their deployment to Guam, from which they will operate in support of SOCOM, not 3MEF. They just happen to be Marines out of Marine Special Operations Command. They will operate from Guam and operate all over the Asia Pacific theater. We will have some logistics responsibilities to support them uh, as they begin this buildup, and then ultimately when they deploy, should they need additional logistics capabilities, we would be able to provide that to them. So we have a very tight relationship with Special Operations Command, um, and one that is growing based on the guidance and the partnership between, uh, between Admiral McRaven and General Amos. In the back, yeah. Thank you. Uh, David Lynch with Bloomberg. Uh, General, I'd like to ask you about the U.S. rebalance or pivot to uh, Asia. First, have, has that uh, shift in, in policy or in emphasis increased the forces at your disposal at all? And second, given the uh, activities we've seen from the Chinese over the last six months or a year, uh, I'm curious as to your assessment of China's intentions in the region. Yeah, I can I'll certainly be glad to comment on the forces available. We just uh, we, we will complete in early fiscal year 2015, so this fall, October of 2014, we will complete the, the, the rebalance, the Marine Corps, if you will, rebalance to the Pacific. Uh, that will include increased capabilities from where we were in 2003. In 2003, we had four infantry battalions as the core ground combat capability uh, in three Marine Expeditionary Force forward deployed to Okinawa. We've always had our additional two infantry battalions uh, in Hawaii, but I'm talking now about the forces west of the international dateline. Uh, our Commandant, uh, as we started to come out of Afghanistan, made the decision that we would begin as soon as we could support it and maintain at least a one to two deployment to dwell ratio, we would begin our redeployment. We concluded the uh, buildup of those infantry battalions last year. So we now have four infantry battalions at all times, uh, either on Okinawa or training in some 
country in the Asia Pacific west of the International Dateline. That does include the one infantry battalion I mentioned that is currently located in Australia. So I have an infantry battalion in Australia, I have one infantry battalion that's always with the 31st Marine Expeditionary Unit, and I have two other infantry battalions that are participating in training um, either on Okinawa, on mainland Japan, or somewhere else in the Asia Pacific theater. So our rebalance, uh, yes, it has given more forces. If you were to look at a snapshot of what three Marine Expeditionary Force looked like uh, two years ago, you would, you would have seen a significant growth in the capability. And it's not just infantry battalions. It's engineers, it's amphibious assault vehicles, it's light armored vehicle capability, it's HIMARS, uh, rocket capability, increased artillery, uh, low altitude area defense. Uh, we've built up now two Marie, uh, MV-22 squadrons permanently uh, on uh, Okinawa. Uh, we have uh, increased uh, to a full uh, Stovall, short takeoff vertical landing, AV-8 Harrier capability, have a squadron minus capability with part of that squadron always with the Marine Expeditionary Unit. Uh, and then we've got our full uh, complement of fixed-wing fighter aircraft uh, up at Iwakuni Air Station on the mainland. So it has put a significant increase in the forces. In the next, within the next fiscal year, we look to put two additional MV-22 squadrons in Hawaii uh, and then to round out fully our CH-53 capabilities there and our HMLA or light attack helicopter capabilities. So yes, significantly more capability from a Marine Corps perspective, but perhaps more importantly, uh, funding. Our Commandant has, uh, has put the priority of his funding to the operating forces in the, in the Western Pacific. So while the rest of the Marine Corps has seen some degradation of operations and maintenance funds, um, I have seen virtually no degradation in my ability to operate and exercise across the theater. And so that's a significant commitment if you talk about capability uh, that's out there. Also, you've heard a discussion that uh, because of the uh, our current budget situation, uh, that there's a very, very real possibility that the Marine Corps will will shrink to 175,000 man Marine Corps uh, from today, where we sit slightly above 192,000, uh, coming down from our all-time high of 202,000. When that is complete, when we draw down to the last man, and we're at 175,000. Marines, there will still be 30,000 Marines in three Marine Expeditionary Force, nearly. Uh, and those 19,000 will grow to somewhere around 22,000 uh, total west of the international dateline. So even though our total force will draw down, our commitment to the Pacific as a percentage of that core will actually increase significantly, but will in fact remain at its current level with the remainder of those uh, that round out that I said will be completed by the early, uh, early fall this year. So we are committed to that. Uh, in terms of what the Chinese or intentions are, uh, I pay no attention. Uh, I, I, it would be speculation on my part to tell you what the Chinese intentions are. I can tell you this. Uh, there's been a decided uh, uh, effort, and I read uh, in, the, in the papers today, uh, agreement on expanded mill-to-mill -mill opportunities between the U.S. and China uh, in the Asia theater. And as I mentioned, uh, we are last uh, it already took place. Not well publicized, but there was a Marine uh, engineer platoon side by side with a Chinese engineer platoon in Thailand, uh, doing doing work together as part of Exercise Cobra Gold. So I think we're already seeing uh, an expansion of those uh, mill to mill relationships and and building uh, building uh, uh, you know familiarity with uh, with each of our our military capabilities. And based on the, what I read today, that looks to be increased somewhere in the future. What, what exactly that means, I, I can't tell you. Probably a better question for Admiral Locke there. I've got a question right here. Coming around. Uh, General, thank you very much for the opportunity today. Um, I'm Ichiro Kabasawa with NHK Japanese Public TV. Um, the governor of Okinawa is requesting to the Japanese government to return the Maya station within five years. Mm -hmm. And my question is, would it be operationally feasible for you to close Fema and to move all of your units from Fema to another air station until the new facility is completed? If I understand your, your question is, do, do you think we can 
move before a the facility, facility is, is complete? Yeah. The answer is no. I, I need a new facility to move uh, the capabilities that are currently resident uh, at Fatema. Now, that being said, uh, the C-130 aircraft that are currently at Fatema will move to Iwakuni this summer. Uh, and so they will move because there is a facility at Iwakuni designed uh, to take them. And that's been part of our long-term plan of how we will redistribute our aviation capability uh, from Okinawa. But to move the remainder, to remove our light attack helicopters, uh, to remove our support aircraft, and to move uh, our MV-22s, we will have to have uh, the replacement facility complete. Currently, as you know, scheduled to go up in Hanoko, up at uh, Camp Schwab as an extension of the existing Camp Schwab facility. And in fact, much of the work has already been underway for the past several years in anticipation of the governor signing the landfill permit, which he did in December. That work, uh, the government of Japan is now beginning the very uh, detailed planning efforts and the letting of contracts. And it's expected that sometime about a year from now, we will start to see some of the work take place that will begin uh, the reclamation of some ocean and other things that will be necessary in order to create that new airfield facility. Let me go in the back. Hi, um, thank you. I'm uh, Brad Harris with the uh, Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. Um, a little less than a year ago, the RAND Corporation released a report um, talking that the uh, mili militaries in the region should be prepared for a sudden collapse of the regime in North Korea. I'm curious, um, today, if the North Korean regime collapsed today, how confident are you to be able to coordinate a response with uh, your counterparts in China's military? In China's military? Um, I haven't done any uh, work with the Chinese military, nor do I think it probably would be our responsibility to work out that coordination. Um, any, any response that we would make in support of uh, a sudden collapse of North Korea, if it were to take place, would be through our Republic of Korea, through the South Korean counterparts. And so it would be a coordination, I, I believe, not only between their governments, and obviously there would be coordination between our own governments that would take place, and then that direction would come down from the Pacific Command Commander, Admiral Locklear, and the coordination that he would execute to, to make that happen. I am confident that Admiral Locklear would be able to coordinate anything that was necessary. And we, uh, I, I have on 15 separate opportunities this year, I will send Marines in almost battalion-sized strength to the Republic of Korea to train with the Republic of Korea Marine Corps. So I'm very confident. Uh, and, and in addition to that, we will do two major exercises. We've just completed one key resolve, uh, and we will execute another major exercise, Ulchi Freedom Guardian, uh, in the end of the summer that will allow us to integrate all military capability, not just Marines, but our, our Army, our Air Force, our Navy, uh, with our Korean counterparts. So I'm very confident that we would have a coordinated ability, but that coordination with the Chinese government would more than likely be, I would think, uh, with, uh, with, through the Koreans. I guess I'll try to squeeze in as many as I can here. There's a woman there on the end. Oh, I'm sorry, I had here. Sorry. Thank you. Um, Allison Kaufman from the Center for Naval Analyses. Just one more follow-up question on uh, security cooperation, which is in your position now, what do you see as some of the key challenges in, uh, in security cooperation in the region going forward? Uh, I think probably the, the largest uh, challenge to security cooperation as we go forward will be the resources to be able to do it. Um, the Budget Control Act placed some very severe restrictions on the Department of Defense's uh, funding. Uh, the Budget Balancing Act, which was recently passed, restored most of that funding in fiscal year 14, this current fiscal year, and put to, uh, on the table uh, better funding than the Budget Control Act, but not, not great funding in fiscal year 15. But in fiscal years 16 and beyond, remember, the Budget Control Act was 10 years and, and $550 billion cut, a 55, roughly 52 to $55 billion cut from the 
from the DOD budget uh, annually. So uh, a significant uh, challenge to resources. And so in fiscal year 16 and beyond, those resources are not guaranteed right now. And so I would offer to maintain the pace of what I showed you, the 81 exercises, the ability to get out there and be with our partners in 21 of 36 countries, it takes resources. And it takes those kinds of resources that will be very, very difficult to maintain in light of the, the impact of the Budget Control Act. Uh, as I said, our commandant has committed his resources, but should the very real uh, challenges of the Budget Control Act come to fruition in fiscal year 16 and beyond, uh, operations and maintenance, readiness of the force, uh, modernization, every account uh, that we look at will be challenged, and one of those will be the operations and maintenance funds required to continue our theater security cooperation mission. Next question here. General, I'd like to uh, commend oh, Sorry, we have a microphone coming. Thank you. Thank you. Commend you and your Marines for your operation in the Philippines. That, that was dynamic and wonderful. I'd like to ask you, though, an unprecedented 2024 Marine General. Can you just let us know who you are, sir. No, no, just uh, let us know your name. And Oh, I'm Terry Paul with Cassidy Associates. Thank you. Uh, 2024 former Marine retired generals made a letter, produced a letter to Capitol Hill stating the, the concern about the lack of amphibious ships. I think it's uh, numbers now on active force are probably less than 20 years ago. Uh, does that concern you and you share their uh, desire and need that we address that shortfall? Yes, uh, not because 20 retired generals said so. I mean, more importantly, the chief of naval operations as recently as this week, Admiral Greenert said he needs 50 amphibious ships to meet the requirements that he has. Now, General Amos and Admiral Greenert have agreed that given the current funding environment that we can only probably afford 33 amphibious ships. Uh, we have a real requirement for 38 in order to execute our support to operation plans, if you will. But the 50 is to meet the presence requirements around the world uh, in support of combatant commanders. Those, if we had 33, we would be able to generate 30 amphibious ships, which correlates to 10 of our amphibious ready groups to support operations around, around the world. So uh, there is a challenge to amphibious ships. And uh, you know, our commandant refers to amphibious ships as the, uh, the Swiss Army knife, if you will, of capability in our Navy. They can do things. We brought two amphibious ships down to uh, support operations in support of the Philippines, brought the Marines. We didn't load them in the traditional way. We didn't load them with the Marine Expeditionary Unit. We loaded them heavy in water purification capability, in engineer equipment, the ability to move and to transport supplies. Uh, and we brought Marines, limited infantry capability, but more our, our, uh, our medical capabilities and our ability with our engineers to do and to help things. So that, that, those amphibious ships allow us to respond across that uh, that, that range of military operations. And so not only are those retired general officers concerned about amphibious ships, but I would offer the Chief of Naval Operations and our Commandant of the Marine Corps are concerned about it as well. Now, uh, what was kindly left out of my bio was I, I, I was the money guy for the Marine Corps for the three years before I went to 3MEF and my parole was stamped approved from the Pentagon. Um, I know how hard a job the Navy has to produce those amphibious ships. So I'm not, I'm not poking at the United States Navy. Um, this, if, the maritime capabilities of this nation are critical to the rebalance to Asia Pacific. And central to those are their amphibious capabilities. And so the investment in amphibious capabilities must be made uh, if we are, if we're going to be successful in this operation, and you heard Admiral Locklear, in fact, in his testimony, say the exact same thing. So this isn't a rogue Marine who's trying to find some extra amphibious. I think all the people who know most about this theater and most about our national security strategy understand that amphibious ships are part and parcel to success. Well, General, unfortunately, we've we've come to the 
the end of our, our time here, and I, I know plenty of people have more questions, and so I apologize that we're not able to, to get more of them in. Uh, but, but I do want to thank you for coming uh, today and, and be a part of this program on such a beautiful day. Uh, and and uh, General, I really want to thank you. It's, it's been an honor to have you here with us, and, and we appreciate what you and your team do, and, and uh, I want to thank you for, for coming here to be with us today. Oh, thanks. I have the best job in the Marine Corps. I get to work with almost 30,000 of the best young Americans there are on the planet, soldiers and sailors who come to work every day who want to do what they did, and you saw them do on that screen, make a difference for people in the Asia-Pacific theater. So I'm the lucky guy. I just get to represent all those young, young, great Americans here today. So thanks. Thank you, Thank you everyone.